This is the day that the Lord has made, and we are grateful unto him for keeping us, blessing us, sparing our lives, and the Bible tells us to rejoice and be glad therein. Let me welcome you, those in the sanctuary, those who are in virtual spaces, to our midweek Bible study, our time together. I pray that everyone is having a great week and that the blessings of the Lord are upon you. Let's pray. God, we thank you tonight for this opportunity to come together as your people, as we hear your word, as we hear from you. And we pray, oh God, tonight that you would give us clarity of speech, that you will open up our hearts and our minds, that we may be receptive to your word. We thank you, oh God, for continuing to speak to us. And we pray for those in the sanctuary, those who are in virtual spaces, that we will leave this time together encouraged, enlightened, and inspired. It is in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I want to uh, welcome you once again to our midweek service, and I pray that uh, you have had a chance to go to RAM and download our outline as we will start a series of lessons on vision without boundaries, all right? We want to talk about the vision that the Lord has uh, placed on my heart for Pine Grove this year. This is the year 2024 here at Pine Grove of laboring with God, the year of laboring with God. Here's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed? As the Lord gave to each one, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Verse 7 says, so then, neither he, he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Here's the emphasis for tonight and the emphasis for our year of laboring with God. Verse 9 says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. It is so interesting that we start this series of lessons um, post-resurrection. We just celebrated the, the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus on Sunday, and what is so ironic is that even when the women come to the tomb to take care of Jesus' body, the angel says to them, you are looking for the living among the dead. And the angel tells the women to go and tell Jesus' disciples to meet him, all right? The women are commissioned from that point to go and work for God, to spread the good news that Jesus is alive. And even before Jesus, ascends back to the Father. You know, he stayed on earth for 40 more days, and eventually he ascends back to the Father. But before he does, he gives the church its marching orders. He gives the church the great commission. Go ye therefore into all the world, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always. These two episodes teach us that as believers, it's not enough for us to be in the seats, but we have a responsibility to serve and to work for and with God, all right? Many people think that when they get saved, as long as their names are on the roll, as long as they are frequenting the church, they're coming to church and Bible study, that they're fine. But here's the truth of the matter. We are partners with God in ministry. We are co-laborers. We are co-workers with God. First question, what does it mean that we are co-workers with God? Well, being a co-worker with God means that we work together as a unit to achieve what God desires, and part of that is building up the church. Once again, being a co-worker, being a co-laborer, Being a partner with God means that we work together as a unit to achieve what God desires, and part of what God desires is building up the church, all right? That is why Paul emphasized ministry and sharing the good news with people, because being a co-laborer with God is a concept that most Christians tend to misunderstand. In fact, Because of this, we tend to elevate people with certain gifts to a God, to a God-like manner when they do something particularly outstanding. 
This should not be the case. All Christians are called to some sort of ministry or service. Let me say tonight, everybody will not be in the pulpit. That's not everybody's calling. Everybody will not teach Sunday school. That's not everybody's calling. Everybody can't sing in the choir. That's not everybody's calling. But here's what I need you to know tonight. God has gifted everyone with the necessary gifts to labor with him in ministry. Okay? Every one of us is a minister or a servant of Christ. Everybody may not teach, but all of us have a contribution that we can make to ministry in some way, shape, form, or fashion. I want you to get this concept of ministry. Because, beloved, whatever we do in the church, it has to be under the auspices of ministry. If I sing in the choir, guess what I'm doing? I'm ministering. If I usher on the doors, guess what I'm doing? I'm ministering. In whatever capacity I serve in, remember, this is not a club. This is the church. And in the church, God calls us to ministry. Okay? Ministry literally means... Real quick, serving Christ, okay? Ministry literally means serving Christ. Minister, ministry, derived from the same Latin word, which simply means to serve, all right? It simply means to serve. In the Latin, ministry is the same Greek word where we, where we get our word deacons, diakonos, which simply was a table waiter, okay? I don't really care what they call you in the church, pastor, deacon, mother, President, leader, minister. At the end of the day, let me tell you what we are. Servants. Okay? And if you are operating without a ministry mindset, and if you are operating without serving, you're doing it in vain. These things that we do in the church are not for our population. You're not building a kingdom. Pastor Turner doesn't build a kingdom. You know, at the end of the day, we have a responsibility to serve, okay? And so let me say this. In order to be in Christian ministry, you have to be willing to serve others in some way other than lifting yourself. And our service must be, here it is, for Christ's sake and for God's glory. Whatever your service is, it has to be for Christ's sake and for God's glory. I don't preach just for a name. You don't sing for people to pat you on your back. You don't serve just to be seen. Whatever capacity you serve in in Christian ministry, it has to be, here it is, for Christ's sake and for God's glory. What does this mean? Well, let's look at the New Testament to further understand. Paul says, I want you to be clear tonight, we are co-laborers or co-workers or partners for God's ministry. Paul's two epistles in, to the church at Corinth, 1 and 2 Corinthians, you'll discover if you read those, they speak more than any other book in the New Testament about Christian ministry. Since so many members of the church at Corinth challenged Paul's authority, questioned his legitimacy. Paul had much to say about ministry, in particular, his own ministry as an apostle. He wrote so much about this subject to the Corinthians because he had so many problems with them. Remember, it was the church at Corinth that was divided along the lines of loyalty to their favorite Christian preacher. Because like all ancient Greeks, they admired eloquent speakers like Apollos. And so in the church, they were divided. You had an Apollos group on this side. You had a Paul group on this side. And when you read this text again, here's what Paul says. Really ain't nothing to Paul, ain't nothing to Apollos. At the end of the day, if anything good is going to take place, it's only going to be because of God. Okay? Paul explains early on, in the first Corinth in first Corinthians how their relationship with the Lord was truly different from his and Apollos church leaders beloved tonight we cannot behave like political supporters who try to sway or rally people to our side but we have to understand that the only way 
that the church is going to be successful, she must operate as a team. Consider a football team. 11 players on the field uh, for a team at one time. The players on the bench serve as what? Backups for multiple positions. Some players run defense. Other players run offense. Some block, some kick, some run. Some receive the ball. Every player serves according to what they are gifted, talented, and assigned to do. And in order for the team to win the game, here it is, everybody must pull their weight. In the church, one group or individual doesn't succeed by beating every rival. We are not called in the house of God to compete or outshine with each other. Beloved, we have to remember we are all on the same team, working toward the same goal. And as Paul said, the church represents a field, here it is, of many workers cooperating. There it is, working together with one goal that God's name would be glorified. Church is a lot like a building where walls are constructed by co-workers, all right? This is a beautiful building, took over a year to build, and one person didn't do all of it. You had a person came in, laid the foundation, another person came in, did the framing, another person came in and did um, all of this beautiful sheetrock, all right? But it all worked together for us to have this beautiful building. Same way in the church. You may not do what I do, and I cannot do what you do, here it is, but everybody has a part to play. And if we ever fessed around and got on the same page, what wonders we could do for the glory of God. Understand, beloved, understand, beloved, that in the house of God, there are no big eyes. There are no little U's. Here it is. We labor together. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Reverend Richardson handles Sunday morning. On a given Sunday, we have to thank God for so many people who operate. We have to thank God for the person that opens the building. We have to thank God for the person who makes sure the building is comfortable. We have to thank God for the person who brings their tithes and offerings. We have to thank God for the person who accepts the tithes and offerings. We have to thank God for the person who volunteers time to lead ministries. There's some person, people on the back end who, who deals with audiovisual. We have to thank God for them. We have to thank God for the person who even vacuums the floor, who wants to go to a dirty church. We have to thank God for the person who cleans the restrooms. Somebody has to operate the microphones to make sure that the sound is right. We have to thank God for the person who prays through the week so that songs are sung to the glory of God. We have to thank God for the people to come together to practice to make sure that the music is right. And then you got supposed to get up there and they have to sing. Amen. We have to thank God for the people who sing. Thank God for the people who cause the worship, prayer, and scripture. We have to thank God for the people who attend to our youth. And then at the end of the day, we have to thank God for the worshipers who comes in the sanctuary lifting up holy hands unto our God. Thank God for the word. Somebody has to preach because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. On a given Sunday, so many moving parts and everybody can't do the same thing. But everybody has something they can do. You see where I'm going? Here's what I'm trying to tell you. This is not a one-man operation. This is not a one-woman operation. There are no big eyes, little U's in God's house. Here it is. We must labor together. And the word together simply means with somebody else. We must labor with somebody else. It simply means companionship. It means cooperation. It means close association with other people. It literally takes all of us to make this thing work. Can I just throw this in right quick? You can't work for God and not like people. 
Because in order to effectively work for God, you have to work with people. Amen, somebody. All right? So to make his point, the Apostle Paul frequently used illustrations or comparisons. Here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 3, 9. The church is compared to a field and a building. Here's what he says. You are God's field. You are God's building. You do know that when we're talking about the church, we're not talking about the physical structure. We are the church. And Paul says, as the church, you are God's field. You are God's building. And if we are God's field, then our job must be to what? Grow, not to quarrel with one another. Therefore, being co-workers with God, being co-laborers with God, being partners with God means that we work together as a unit to achieve what God desires, and part of that desire is to build up the church. If you can't work with other people, you can't work for God. Because this is not a one-man operation. I'm not just talking about the church. I'm talking about your ministry. I'm talking about whatever capacity you serve in outside the church. You can't do it by yourself. I'm here. Y'all just not talking. That's why Paul emphasizes ministry and sharing the good news with people. 1 Corinthians 12, 15 through 19, write this down. Very, very, here's what he says. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God, here it is, has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? What if every member of the body was an ear? You wouldn't have nobody that would smell. What if everybody was a nose? You wouldn't have nobody that would ear. Hear. Well, what if every member of the body was the preacher? You wouldn't have nobody to preach to. <laughs> what, what if every member of the body was in the choir stand? You wouldn't have anybody to sing to. What if every member of the body was a greeter? You'd just be greeting yourselves and each other. I'm trying to lay it in your lap by helping you understand that everybody has a part to play. And your part is not my part, and my part is not your part, but what makes the machine work is that when everybody falls in line with what God has called them to do. Every Sunday a person joins Pine Grove, I stand right over there, here's what I say. God has added to his church as he saw fit. Maybe somebody thought I was making it up, but I'm in the Bible. Because verse 18 says this, but now God has set the members, each one of them in the body, just as he pleased. I, said, I, told, I, told, I told the midday Bible study, we're not a fraternity or a sorority here. We don't haze people. We don't have to pledge you before you can serve. Amen, somebody. It's not, it doesn't matter where you come from or what your last name is or who your folk is or how much money you make. Amen. Because the Bible says we didn't set the members in the place. God set them here. And if God set them here, who are we to say a person can't serve? Are y'all on board? And so here's what we have to understand. There are, no, there are no big eyes and little U's when it comes to ministry. I have a couple questions I want to, it's on your outline, but I want you to just to think about it. What, why is it inappropriate to devalue some ministry roles or to envy someone else's ministry gifts and or assignments? Why is it so inappropriate to devalue some ministry roles as if mine is more important than yours? Or why is it so inappropriate to envy someone else's gift or assignment? 
it's not, it's not, it's not really appropriate at all for me to get mad or roll my eyes at Reverend Chapman because he can do what I can. Are we on board? That, that speaks to me about a lack of security. And whatever God has gifted you to do, or well, here it is, you ought to be secure in it. And security simply means that what God has given me was for nobody else but me. And what God has given you, catch this, was for nobody else for you. And what we have to do is not fight one another, but come together and use our gifts to the glory of God. So it's, it's, it, it never should be that we devalue some ministry roles or are envious of someone else's ministry gifts. I have a question. Why, why, why is it important to groom and train others who are gifted for ministry service and to encourage people of all ages to use what God has given them to honor him and bless the church? You know, unfortunately, some of us stay in these positions forever. Y'all don't like me, but I'm here. Some of us think that it can't move on without us. And beloved, if you have that kind of thinking, I double dog dare you to die. Because if you die, guess what? What you're doing is not going to die. Because the Lord always has a remnant, watch this, because his kingdom is bigger than one person. Not the first past the pine grove. And if the Lord delays his coming, I won't be the last. But what we have to remember is that whatever we do, we are operating in a season. And my job is not to lord, but to serve faithfully in the season I'm in. My God. And here's the characteristic of any good leader. Any good leader makes sure that there's always somebody else that can take the baton and keep it moving. Amen. And, and another thing about a good leader, another, a good leader knows when their season is up. God the mighty. And they care more about the organization than they do about their own ego or whatever you want to call it. This is the last question. When people say there is no I in team, what do they mean? There's no I in team. Here's what it simply means, that in order for us to be successful, we must work together. And that's what this whole lesson is about. As a child of God, here's who, here's who I am. I'm a co-laborer with God. I work with God. I'm in partnership with God in order to see his kingdom blessed. And when I understand that I am in partnership with God, it should lead me to give the best I have. Listen, I was so blessed, and I said it Sunday, and I'm, I was so honest. Trey Junkin blessed me. That young man got up there with that cello and started that song, and that cello was not in tune. He stopped in the middle of it. He said, Daddy, come on, tune it up. Some folk laughed, but that was a message for me there is that you all not offer God anything that's out of tune. You think about somebody who loved you so much that they would come le hang, bleed, and die for your sins, and a God that loves you so much that he would give his son and then raise his son up on the third day, and you're going to give him some worship that's out of tune? Or service? Well, they just better be glad I'm here. No, ma'am, no, sir. He deserves better than that. But they ain't paying me. Well, your boss can't pay you by how he pays you. Talk back to me. Whatever I do for God, I must do it with a genuine heart because I'm in partnership with him. Here's this, here's this other piece. We are co-laborers with God, not only in ministry, but we're co-laborers with God and also in creation. In creation. Now, Paul's passage contains another beautiful image, one which 
not only Paul depicts as a ministry of, of the apostle, but he also describes the Christian life. Here's what he says. We are God's fellow workers. That's what Paul calls us as ministers in 1 Corinthians 3, 9. We are God's workers. We are God's partners. We, we are God's synergist. Let me say it again. We work for God. My goodness. We work for God. We don't preach for man. We don't sing for man. We don't serve for man. We work for God. Even outside of the church, God strategically placed you where you are. And so if you're a Chapman and you're in the classroom, somehow, some way, we've got to figure out how to use that space for God to get some glory. I'm just trying to help us, beloved, because too many of us are just living day by day and not living on purpose. And every day we wake up, remember, beloved, God woke you up for a purpose. We work for God. And something about knowing that I work for God, that should really govern how I carry myself. Watch this. Because too many of us, well, they, made, they said something to me made me mad, so I stopped doing what I do. I'm not ushering no more. I'm not greeting no more. I'm quitting the brotherhood. I'm quitting the women's ministry. I don't like what they did. You don't work for them. If God gave you the gift, you have an obligation to be faithful to him. And don't let nobody make you sit down on what God has given you. God, I feel like a preacher tonight. Don't, do you know who you work for? You don't work for Pastor Turner. You work for God. All right? Now, I, I look at this creation piece, and I also thought about the fact that everything we have was given to us by who? Okay? We have a responsibility to God, even as stewards, to be co-laborers with him, to take care of what God has given us. Psalms 24 and 1 says, the earth is the Lord's, and everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. You know, God gifted us with our children. And even in that, we have a responsibility to be in partnership with God, even as how we raise our children. God has placed you on the job you're in, and you have a responsibility, watch this, as a partner, as a worker with God, to work with him even on that job. Everything on earth belongs to the Lord. And as stewards, we have to recognize that we are merely caretakers of God's creation and we have to handle it with reverence and respect. That's why every day we have to wake up in the morning and say, God, how today are you seeking to use me to bring your name glory? Here's the third we are co-workers with God in ministry. We are co-workers with God in creation, but we're also co-workers with God with his promises, okay? Now, let me tell you one of the beauties of salvation is that God enlists each one of us as co-workers or partners or co-laborers in his great work of salvation. You know, it's not God's desire, Peter tells us, that anyone should be lost. God in glory has a desire that everyone be saved. Now, what we understand from the Bible, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, that only God has the power to save anybody. Yet and still, each of us have a role to play in God's saving work. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, here it is. For it is by grace you're saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance to us to do. 
This is Bible study, right? Philippians 2, 12 through 13, Paul advised the saints to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. John 15, 4 through 5 says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Here's what he says. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We are not the savers, we, savior. We're, we're, we're not the one who save people. But we do have a part to play in men and women coming into a knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When was the last time you led somebody to the Lord? When was the last time you shared your testimony and it caused somebody else to say, I want to know that God? When was the last time you brought somebody else to church? I, Pastor, I'm not comfortable uh, being out in Publix and targeting Walmart and asking people if they know Jesus. I'm not comfortable. But you can invite somebody to church with you. Okay? Here's what I need us to understand. We partner with God in the salvation of men and women. And salvation, that does not just fall on the preacher. When people get up and sing in the choir, you don't know how that song permeates a person's heart. That, that song prepares the ground for the word. The way you greet people when they come in with a smile prepares the ground for the word. And we as disciples have a part to play in sharing this gospel. How, Pastor Turner, tonight can I work with God in this salvation plan? I'm glad you asked. We could pray for those who are unsaved. It's called intercessory prayer, praying for our family, praying for our, our friends. You know people who are unsaved? Put them on your prayer list. Because only God can save. But guess what we can do? We can pray for him. What can we do to co-labor with God with, with this salvation plan? You can share your testimony. You can tell people what God has done for you in your life when you weren't fit to live, weren't ready to die, and how God came in and saved your life. But most important, let me tell you what you can do as a co-worker with God in salvation. You can live a life that speaks for you. I see, people, I see people in the store, and I have on my suit or whatever. They say, you Pastor Turner? I say, I try. You Reverend Turner? I try. And you, too, probably have had the same encounter. Even if they didn't know you by title, they said, it's something about, are you saved? It's something about you. You know what that's called? Living a life before people that reflects the glory of God. One of the biggest ways we can lead men and women to Christ is by living Christ-like in front of them. And we have an obligation, not just on Sunday, but every day of our lives. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. We have an obligation every day to wake up and leave our home saying, today, God, I want to live in such a way that people see my good works, but give your name glory. Let me sum it up. What does being a co-worker with God mean? Well. Being a co-worker with God, being a co-laborer with God, being a partner with God does not mean that God needs the laborers for him to do his work. That does not, that's not what, it, God does not need us to do his work. You do know that he created everything by himself. <laughs> so God does not need us to do his work. Instead, being a co-worker simply means that I have to be a good steward of what God has entrusted to me. And if God has entrusted unto me a gift, I am obligated to use that gift for Christ's sake and for God's glory. God has given me a gift. If I can sing, you know who gave that to me, God. If I've been called to preach, you know who called me, God. If I have the ministry of hospitality and I serve out there as a greeter or an usher, you know who gave me that ministry, God. 
And so being a co-laborer with God simply means I use what God has given me for Christ's sake and for God's glory. And God is not pleased if we are not serving in ministry. Whew, this is good. It means I have a responsibility to take care of what God has given me. And you know, you know what that is? Everything. Everything I have, God gave it to me. So I have a responsibility, beloved, to take care of everything God has given me. I told the 12 o'clock crowd that, um, I, I mean, even as your preacher, your pastor, even as the preacher, um, every week I partner with God in preaching, right? For the most part, I partner with God in preaching. And I know I have acid reflux. And I know that spaghetti sauce aggravates my acid reflux. Amen. So what do I look like coming in here on Sunday saying, Lord, hold my voice when I know I haven't been a good steward of my temple by putting something in the temple that was going to affect my way of serving? That's what partnering with God means, that I understand on this day I'm called to serve. And I don't wait until Sunday to get ready to serve. But even as I, how I take care of my temple is a reflection of how serious I'm taking my partnership with God. Remember the old people, and I'm through, old people used to sing a song, make a statement at everybody's funeral, and they said, may the works I've done speak for me, the life I live, the service I give. When I'm resting in my grave, there's nothing more to be said. May the works I've done speak for me. Let me tell you something. You don't have to die for your works to speak. They speak in there whether they're speaking negatively or positively. If you're serving, your works are speaking, okay? But we have to understand that partnering with God is all about reflecting the character of Christ in every area of my life. It's not about me just coming to church on Sunday and putting on a show, but the way I live Monday through Saturday and even Sunday is a reflection of how serious I take my partnership with God. You don't know who you come in contact with who needs a kind word. It's your responsibility as a partner with God to give it. I don't have the, I don't have the, the latitude to be mean. I don't, I don't. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I've been called higher. And so I'm a partner with God. I'm a worker with God. And so I cannot just say anything that comes to my mind because my partnership demands that I reflect the character of Christ. Whew, God talk. I'm trying. This, this calls us to a higher level of discipleship because I understand I am not my own. I've been bought with a price. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Here it is, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, perfect, acceptable will of God. Verse 1 says, based on what God has done for you, you ought not mind presenting your body and your life and your service as a living sacrifice. You know, just like Jesus, we must commit ourselves to the Father's business. I'm going to say it one more time. Just like Jesus, we must commit ourselves to the Father's business. You don't have no business. It's God's business. <laughs> you don't have an agenda. It's God's agenda. The only way you make plans, according to James, is that you make sure you say, if it's the Lord's will. You don't have plans. And perhaps that's why we stay running into the ditch. It's because we're trying to govern our own lives. You, no, 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 no. <laughs> Every day, we must be about the Father's. This is what it means to partner with God. We make his priorities our priorities. 
We make his business our business. God has specific plans or assignments for each of us. and He has called and gifted us to do the work. The truth is that this ministry, this work, will remain undone if we do not put our hands to the task. Think about it. If you don't pull your weight, the poor will not be served. If you don't pull your weight, the hunger will not be fed. If you don't pull your weight, the lost will never hear the gospel. If you don't pull your weight, disciples will not be taught. And Lord, Lord knows, if we don't pull our weight, souls will not be added to the kingdom of God. But Lord, we got to do our part. We are co-laborers with God. We are co-workers with God. We are in partnership with God. You know, we used to pray. I'm through. Lord, go to the hospital. Go to the nursing home. Go to the jail. Check on this person. Check on that person. No. God has equipped us to do the work. And we've got to start taking our mission, our ministries, our assignments serious. Remember, Chairman Sandra, whenever we stand, wherever we stand, we've got to know this is not about us. We're in partnership with God to make sure that the gospel gets out. It's our assignment. Never Sister Davis sings. She stands up there, not for her own health. She's in partnership with God to make sure that Zion's songs go forth. Whenever others serve, we're not just doing it because we ain't got nothing else to do. God is in partnership. We are co-laborers. That simply means us and God together. And if nobody else applauds you for your service, make sure God is pleased. Amen. Questions, comments, concerns for those in the sanctuary? Questions, comments, concerns for those in the sanctuary? We work with God. Okay? Whatever ministry you serve in, you're not serving or working for the pastor. You're not working for the ministry leader. We work with God. We labor with God. We partner with God. It's not about us. It's all about doing those things that bring him glory. All right? And so I pray tonight that we all will leave this, um, this lesson. There, Paul, the Apostle Paul um, has an encounter with God on the Damascus Road, and he's knocked off his beast. He's blinded. And the light shines from heaven. And Paul asked this question in verse 6 of chapter 9 of Acts. Here's what he says. Lord, what would you have me to do? God knocks him off the beast, blinds him. And Paul looks up, sees the light from heaven, and he says, Lord, what would you have me to do? And beloved, we just celebrated Easter, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we celebrated a God who was willing to go all the way for us. And I pray that we leave this building tonight understanding that we're partners with God, we're co-laborers with God, we're workers with God. I pray we leave this building and meditate all night on this one question. Lord, what would you have me to do? In my church, what would you have me to do? In my community, what would you have me to do? In my home, what would you have me to do? And even on my job, Lord, what would you have me to do? Because here's what, here's what happens. God can use you to do extraordinary things if you will only submit to him leading you, okay? God will use Pine Grove to do wonderful things if we understand it's not about us, but it's all about this partnership that we have with God. Pine Grove, we are partners with God. Amen? God bless you tonight. I thank God for each of you in the sanctuary, those in virtual spaces, we praise God for our youth and the, uh, those who are working with our youth on tonight. Um, God bless you. Let's continue to pray for all of our known sick, shut-in, burdened, and bereaved. Brother LeVon Umphrey was moved from Madison Hospital to Huntsville. Praise God. We think we have a diagnosis and a treatment plan that's going to get him back on a good foot. So let's continue to pray for 
him and all others who are dealing with this season of sickness and grief. Uh, God is still able to do above and beyond all we can ask or think, all right? Listen, don't forget, uh, Sunday is a good day. It's worship day, and we are baptizing five individuals who have given their souls, their lives to Jesus. Uh, be in the place so you can witness that grand occasion. We have some pastor's anniversary um, events that are coming up. Please check RAM um, so that we can participate in those festivities. We will not have Bible study next week, but we will have pre-anniversary with our friend, Pastor Dion Watkins in the Progressive Union Missionary Baptist Church. So I want to see you in the place um, next Wednesday, uh, but until that day, until that time, we're praying that the Lord will continue to bless you and keep you. God, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for each of these individuals who have joined us via social media outlets and in person. And we pray, oh God, that you would sink it deep down in our hearts that we are not our own, but we've been bought with a price. And you're calling us, commissioning us to come to partnership with you. Help us, oh God, to serve understanding that we're serving as unto the Lord. Help us to give understanding that we're giving as unto the Lord. Help us, God, keep us humble daily. Keep us focused daily. Help your priorities to become ours. Help your business to become ours. Help your goals and aims and ambitions to become ours so that daily we're doing those things that bring your name glory. Thank you, God, for our young people. Continue to bless their lives. Keep them covered safe from all hurt, harm, and danger. As we leave this place tonight, give us safe passage back to our destinations. We will be careful to give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless each of you.